just to get started here, uh, this is the, the topics that we're going to cover specifically tonight. Now, I'm going to be doing a lot of reading throughout this, okay? Uh, so between the reading and the visual, it's just, you know, I, mind me, I can't, I can't remember all these quotes by memory, so, so I'm going to be reading. Life expectancy, what you're told versus what reality actually says, okay? What's happened to life expectancy in the last 10 years? Anybody? It's going up. How many people say up? Raise your hand. Come on, raise them up. Okay, how many people say down? Raise your hand. Okay. Since I talked to you today, I was like, okay, so I guess I should have rephrased that question. Right. You know, so, but we're, okay, what does the media, who has heard the media say life expectancy is going up? How many people have heard that? Yeah, everybody's heard that. Uh, well, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Healthy longevity. Uh, literally, the, the, you know, the magic ball seen through current trends, you know, on what, what is really happening. I'm going to show you on, you know, what we can expect to see in the future that you're not seeing on any media outlets. But the scary truth of what is really happening. Uh, bankrupt, you know, how health care costs are literally, they're, ju they're just killing us. And if we don't change it, more access to health care is not going to change the situation. It's not going to change it. Doctors, you know, saviors or saboteurs, you know, we really think that, you know, the more doctors we have, the better off we're going to be in terms of life expectancy. Uh, the next generation, what, what we are actually expecting to see there, uh, antioxidants and what role they play, the two most powerful ones that really, you know, science knows right now. As far as hormones, what the master hormone is in the body that controls the whole aging process and how your body stays young. And then, of course, the common thread. Anybody know what that is? What's the common thread? <laughs> Come on, maximize the living patience. The nerves? The nerve system, of course. Okay. You knew we weren't going to not talk about that. So, okay, life expectancy. Here's a big lie. Uh, the increase in life expectancy that you see all over the media, this is mainly due to fewer deaths of young children. Okay, just think about that for a second. That the, the fewer, you know, the, the longer we can make kids live and the less that we lose the more it skews the overall numbers. I mean, if, if we have, you know, hundreds of thousands of babies dying from all these, you know, uh, big diseases like diphtheria and pertussis and polio and all this other stuff, you see how that would skew the numbers? Mm -hmm. Because it's going to bring the overall life expectancy down. Well, what? guess what happened? Since we changed all the sanitary and, you know, all the sanitation standards, are we having those kind of diseases? Notice I did not say since we initiated vaccination. Yeah, and you know in the patient manual, which you guys are all going to be able to sign up for here very shortly, um, it is done, and it shows you very clearly in there a graph showing all of the vaccinations of the the disease actually falling, 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 and then the vaccinations come on the market. So it's not the vaccinations; it's sanitation standards. Mm -hmm. So that skewed the numbers, um, particularly in the first year of life. If we eliminate that influence. By just looking at 65 to 70 years of age, you, you see that it's actually only about a two to four different, two to four year difference overall over the past century. Two to four years. Is that a big deal? No. no. In fact, you go back to the 1600s, I told a couple people this today, just wild fact that I came across while researching this stuff, uh, that th back in the 1600s, there was a guy that actually lived to 154 years old. We're not talking mm -hmm. biblical days. We're talking just a couple hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, a guy lived to 154. You know, and, and so, you know, are we really going forward? Are we really moving back? So uh, here's, here's what the truth is, you know, according to some, just a, a few of the statistics. The U.S. tied with Malta. Who, who knows where Malta is? <laughs> I, don't. I don't. even I don't even know where that is. In Slovakia, for the mm -hmm. second worst infant mortality rate among developed nations. Would you expect that Malta and Slovakia have incredible health care systems? No, probably not. Well, I, w I wouldn't. I've never even heard of them. How could they have billions and billions of dollars to pump into uh, research and medical development? I, d I don't see it happening. That was uh, from the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, the, US, the U.S.'s relative position has declined steadily. 1960. It had the 12th lowest infant mortality rate in, in, in the world. By 1990, that's just 30 years later, we had dropped to 23rd. Okay, so that was 30 years to go from, from 12 to 23. By 2004, we had dropped to 29th. And as of the last one, the U.S. now is 34th. Would you say that's a pretty quick slide? 
You know, so we're seeing the infant mortality get worse and worse and worse at an accelerating pace. I, you know, I, I couldn't quote it on this one, but uh, because I couldn't find the actual research that says it, but I know, I, I mean, we use it in our doctor's report that we're actually the worst in infant mortality rate among developed nations. So I think that number has slid since, you know, since whenever this quote was, was posted, okay? So, you know, either way you look at it, it's just, you know, something's not right there. So the idea there is, you know, you would expect that, you know, we would, we would have this increase in life expectancy from decreasing death rates in children because our healthcare system has gotten so good at keeping children from dying. But the reality is we're actually the worst that's out there or the second worst by the best set of numbers, right? So it's not because of those factors. It's just surely because, you know, we're not dying from from the infectious diseases like we used to. What does that come down to? Sanitation standards. So I'd say sanitation is probably a pretty good measure of life expectancy. Okay, over the past 20 years, the U.S. has sunk from ranking number 11 to ranking number 42 uh, in terms of overall, uh, overall life expectancy for children. In other words, a baby born in 2004 in any one of 41 other countries can expect to live longer than his or her American counterpart. That's pretty scary, ain't it? So, you know, you would think, again, you know, that we're in such good shape here in this country, but, I mean, the, the facts just constantly tell the opposite. Forty years, 1959 to 2001, a tracking life expectancy reveals gains and losses for various groups. Four percent of the male population and 19 percent of the female population experienced actually either a decline or stagnation in life expectancy beginning in the 1980s. So what, what happened, you know, just before the 1980s? I mean, let's just, yeah, I mean, let's just throw some stuff out there. Basically, what it comes down to, vaccinations, we started using a lot more medications. You know, you've just seen this acceleration of medical care, just bang, 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 just more and more and more, just blowing up all over the place. So here come the 1980s, and all of a sudden, we start seeing ourselves go back down. So women, you know, they're, they're actually saying children, this is the first generation, okay, the first generation of kids right now that are not going to live Past their parents. How scary is that? Imagine, you know, you've got kids right now, and that if, if you're in the average group, that for the first time you're actually going to see your children die before you do. Mm. Yeah. It's, you guys, I've been there. It's not fun. You know, but that's mm. going to happen just because our kids aren't taking care of themselves or because we're not taking care of our kids properly. It's not because of heart defects. It's not because of the uncontrolled. It's because of things that we're just not paying attention to. So uh, the majority of U.S. Count counties that had the worst downward swings, guess where? Right here. Yeah. Alabama and, and Mississippi in the Deep South. We're the worst off of anywhere. This was Harvard School of Public Health and the University <laughs> of Washington. So, looking at longevity and disease, approximately 125 million Americans, that's 45% of the population, had one or more chronic conditions in the, in the year 2000. 61 million, or 21% of the population, had multiple chronic conditions. So, you know, to put those in layman's terms, that's, you know, one, two, three, four, five, two chronic conditions, one, two, three, four, five, two chronic conditions. It's literally one in five people have two or more chronic conditions. Okay, it's estimated that the population of people with chronic conditions will increase steadily in the next two decades so that by 2020, 164 million now will have, uh, that's over 50% of the population, will have one chronic condition and 81 million, 25%, 24% will have two or more. So now from one in five up to one in four. So you look at the graph here, this was in 2000, this is in 2020. Where are we looking in 2040, 2060? Get there. Yeah, we might not get there. You're right. I mean, we're going to see everything. How'd that happen? Okay, it only went forward one. Who in here has got a clicker? Okay, so from 1900 to 1997, deaths from heart disease up from 6.2% to 31.4%. That's advancements in healthcare, right? You know, we made all these big advancements in healthcare. Yet the number is 6.2% up to 31%. Have we really made advancements? I'd say the opposite, right? Because the more advancements we make, the more we seem to think we can do anything we want to and get away with it because 
you know, the, the, the uh, superhero in the white coat is going to save us. Mm. You know, all they have to do is lay you down on the table, cut your chest open, you know, sew a few things up, and voila, you're ready to go. Increase 506% over that time frame. Okay, you can look at this right here. Leading cause of death in 1900. What's the leading cause of death in 1900? Pneumonia. What is that? An infectious disease. Number two, tuberculosis. What is that? An infectious disease. Number three, diarrhea and enteritis. Infectious disease. Number four, finally down here is heart disease, 6.2%. And then liver disease, injuries, cancer, senility, whatever, and diphtheria, another infectious disease. So now we see heart disease and cancer, which are not, are those infectious diseases? No, do you no, catch no. cancer? No. no. Do you catch heart disease? What, what are they? I got my hair cut today. Doesn't it look nice? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm sitting there, and the lady is, every time I go to get my hair cut, it never fails. I, I, I mean, it's like a joke. When I go in and I, uh, sorry, cheesy haircut comment. Um, <laughs> so when, uh, when I go in to get my hair cut, it's a joke that I can never get out of there without talking about chiropractic. But, I mean, that's like everywhere, you know. So I'm sitting there, and it, it never fails. Every time I sit down, they start talking about somebody's health problems. And they're sitting there talking about cancer and how this person's got cancer and all that. And I'm just biting my lip, and finally I'm just like, okay. I'm, you know, I, I, so, all right, I've, I've you know, the, the cancer is not this, yada, yada, And I start throwing out all these statistics. They're like, who are you? <laughs> so, so uh, but you can't catch cancer. You can't catch heart disease. You develop it. That's why the mm -hmm. modern techniques, you know, and treatments don't work because they're not reversing what helped you develop it, right? Mm -hmm. So you got to reverse what helped you develop it to fix it. Anyways, deaths from cancer uh, from 3.7 percent to 23.3 percent. That's an increase of 629 percent over that same time period. So you can see, I mean, we're just going in the completely wrong direction on these things. You know, we should see a dramatic drop-off. Just imagine if we kept heart disease and cancer where they were back here at 6.2 and 3.7%. Now, here's what a lot of people are going to say, right? Uh, you know, and this, this is one of the common elements that, that you hear in the media, is that, well, the reason the numbers were so low is because we didn't have the technology to detect it. Uh, who in here has heard that one? You know, that we're detecting cancer more and more than ever. Well, if that's the case, then why don't you see, you know, why is it that when you look at all the research in terms of cancer research, that they all say that we're, you know, that we're seeing cancer patients live longer and longer, but you notice that all of them are cut off at five-year studies, okay? So what basically is happening is that they're diagnosing it earlier, but they still cut off the studies. So it's like we know that there's this definitive point in time where people die from the cancer, right? And we used to only be able to diagnose them here. So it looked like they only lived this long, right? But now with this new technology, we're able to diagnose them way back here. But they're actually dying still either here or even further back. So that we're actually dying, they're actually dying faster because of the treatments. But it looks as if we're actually living longer. Do you see how that works? You know, but nonetheless, this is one of the things I was telling them. All the cancer research that's out there, they always cut the studies off at five years because they know what happens. It comes back. Yeah, mm -hmm. it comes back. Oh, my goodness, you know, it was in remission. This, this was a conversation today. It was in remission, but now it's come back. And I'm just sitting there, and finally, that's the point where I chimed in. Of course it does. <laughs> it always does. <laughs> so... Okay, the rising cost. This is just the cost of you know what, what's happening in terms of longevity. An average couple retiring this year uh, will need, this was in 2006, will need $200,000 to cover their health care costs for 20 years in retirement. Without a show of hands, maybe you know, I'll wink, wink, who in here has managed to save up that just for their health care expenses? Okay? Uh, that, that's for 20 years, not including the expense of long-term care should they need it. Okay, they went back and they did this again. Retirement health care costs are pushing even higher with a 65-year-old couple who retires this year needing 215000 That's in 2007. Mm -hmm. So it went from 200000 to 215000 Okay, the year before that, guess what? It was 190000 mm -hmm. Do you see the trend happening there? So where's it going to be in another 10 years? Or, or another mm -hmm. 5 years? <laughs> this is what they say. So it's statistics show... The cost of medical care has outpaced inflation for the past 20 years in a row. Mm -hmm. 
okay? And prices are projected to increase as much as 15% annually. So at that rate, retirees can expect to see their health care costs double in just five years. In the next five years, actually double. Can Medicare afford that? No. Can, can private insurance afford that? No. Why do you think people don't have private insurance now? Because they can't afford it. Because we can't afford to pay for all the cancer and heart disease treatment and everything else that's going on out there. There's no cap on cost. It's just basically like, well, this sounds like a good idea. You know, if we start this insurance, well, then we can get the healthy people to pay for the sick people. Well, they never thought, what happens when the sick people outpace the healthy people? And that's exactly the beast that we've, that we've developed mm -hmm. through all this. So now of 1,500 couples interviewed, all age 70 or older, 45% they had lost more than, more than half of their retirement savings before the recession, right? Now we lose the other half. When one spouse was diagnosed with a new medical problem such as high blood pressure, cancer, stroke, or arthritis. Likewise, the me now hang on, go back to this. High blood pressure, is that something you catch or something that you develop? So that means it's a preventable disease. Okay, what about cancer? Is that preventable or non-preventable? Yeah, preventable. preventable. What about stroke? What about arthritis? All preventable disease. Okay? Likewise, the majority of the single seniors interviewed, 60% uh, said they had lost at least 10% of their savings paving, paying for treatment of pre-existing conditions. Okay? So now you see why, well, on the posters it says, you know, would you like to know how you could pass down double to your grandchildren, you know, at, at the time of your death, you know, literally pass down bigger inheritance. Well, if it's not all going to the doctors, if you're not doubling it every five years, you can see how that's an easy reality, you know, because uh, the money just isn't going out in healthcare expense. So, okay, what about doctors, though? You know, we've got all these doctors out there, we, we you know, we just need more doctors, right? Who in here thinks we need more doctors? We need more doctors, better access. That's what all the talk is. Okay, that is what all the talk is. We need more access. <laughs> Systemic evidence is surprisingly consistent. It implies an association between mortality and an increase in the doctor's supply. Mm -hmm. Ouch. So the more doctors that there are, the higher the mortality rates we see, which is not easily attributed to whatever, you know, and blah, 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 blah. So their work continues in saying people have an erroneous and exaggerated belief in the, in the efficacy of modern medicine. Would anybody in here find that to be true? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have this huge, and it's and it goes so much deeper than that. It's literally a fear-based thing because even in my patient base, you know, maximize living patients, you know, who know the principle, who have heard the principle, who are talking, you know, who are given the articles, who are exposed to all this stuff all the time. Guess what? Fear strikes. You know, we get diagnosed with something, and all of a sudden, ah, you know, and and it's like we, we hit the default switch right back into you know, and, and the second you get in that rat wheel, what happens? You're you're caught in the trap. You know, your legs just start spinning. You know, I can't tell you how many good, solid patients I have lost in in just the past five years because some little thing happened. And it, and it turned into, well, you know, this happened and my doctor said that, you know, I, I really ought to not come back until, until I get this cleared up and guess what, I'll never see him again. You know, because mm -hmm. they get their legs caught in the trap and then just, mm -hmm. you know, game over. So, there is a clear correlation between the astonishing increase in medical options, drugs and surgery primarily, and a deterioration in public health. So, anybody in here know why? I think we all know why, but... But why is that? In, in one concise sense, can anybody tell me why? They don't want you well. <laughs> well, I think doctors really do want you well. Oh, no. <laughs> Modern medicine can't treat chronic disease. It's mostly an acute form of treatment. Right, right. Why not? Mm -hmm. Why not? Because they keep on giving you drugs. You it deals keep... with the symptoms and not with the original problem. Mm -hmm. Bingo. Not the cost. Doesn't treat the cause. Yeah. Go ahead. I was just simply going to say, the doctors I think are trained in medical school by courses that are put together by pharmaceutical companies. Bingo. Pharmaceutical companies' objective is to maintenance symptoms, yeah. yep. not to cure disease. There's no profit in curing disease. Mm -hmm. Well, this is good news. Harvard University. I've got it on the on the uh, board back there. Harvard University, there's a coalition of some 200 and something students that have organized and gotten together. They're trying to kick the pharmaceutical companies out of the school because they know that they're, they've got way too much influence. So they're actually organizing and trying to get the drug influence out. 
because it basically owns the school. Mm -hmm. You know, especially right now because, you know, you guys might have heard this on the news at Harvard and Yale and all these big, big uh, colleges that have these billions of dollars set aside, you know, in their endowments that they've lost like, you know, 60% of their endowments. So they're freaking out on what's, you know, because of they're all in the stocks. You know, so as they lose that, they're mm -hmm. trying to figure out what they're going to do. So, hey, drug money looks great, right? I mean, it's easy cash, you know, let's go for it. But they don't want it, you know. So even the doctors, here's the thing, the doctors don't want it either. You know, they want to get people well. I honestly believe that. I do believe that. You know, most of them want to get people well. The problem is they don't know how because they don't know the principle. They don't know how the body works. They're not trained in how the body works. I mean, you look at just the physiology and anatomy that they take. I mean, in, in relation to what we get, it's, I mean, it's sad. It really is sad. So, okay, toxicity. Uh, before they take their first breath, as many as 600,000 babies may suffer permanent brain damage from their mother, mother's exposure to mercury pollution. Okay? Now, in this one, you know, in this study, it's kind of ironic. They were trying to point the finger at eating fish, you know, that eating tuna and stuff. But, guys, that is like one of the lowest exposures of mercury. The largest exposure is what's in our mouths. It's the mercury amalgam fillings. We've got the, the videos, the articles, the research, and everything that proves you know, that, that they're constantly seeping in, and they have an affinity straight to the fetus. They literally, you, the, the fetus gets twice as much of the mercury vapor that the mother does. So, you know, permanent brain damage, and how many people have silver fillings in their mouths? You know, and that's mercury. Silver is actually, you know, a, a little bit better, so we actually use silver. Children have disproportionately hot, heavy exposures to environmental tox toxicants, but their metabolic pathways, especially in the first months of birth, are immature. But it isn't a good idea to go ahead and inject them with vaccinations that contain mercury and aborted fetal tissue and formaldehyde and aluminum and antifreeze and, you know, all these other, you know, contaminants. Good idea, right? So... You know, you can see we're just setting ourselves up again and again and again for just even, I mean, we have never before seen where 80, you know, kids, kids by the age of six years old are getting 80 plus vaccinations. So where's it going to go now? You know, what are we really going to see the health trends do now that things have gotten this out of control? So watch this video here. This kind of gives you a, a clue in. <laughs> I don't like going to the doctor, so this is no fun. Not a big fan of needles. I'm here for what's called a body burden test. It's not the most pleasant of procedures. It'll take 120 cc's of blood, almost a pint, for scientists to look at traces of 250 industrial chemicals in my body. Let me just ask you, is, um, sure. have you ever had anyone pass out from giving so much blood? I haven't had anyone pass out. I've had no. people get nauseated a little bit. Uh -huh. okay, well, let's get you some orange juice just so that you can uh, fuel up after uh, <laughs> some sugar. That. Public health experts are only beginning to understand what harm, if any, low-level chemical exposure can cause. Dr. Leo Trasande worries most about children. Uh, we're currently in an epidemic of chronic disease among American children, rates of asthma, uh, childhood cancers, birth defects, uh, and developmental disabilities are all on the rise, and increasingly they're being attributed to chemicals that uh, we're all exposed to mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis. You, you really you consider it an epidemic? I do consider it an epidemic. <laughs> Rowan and Michaela Holland are some of the first children to sound the alarm. In the beginning, I wasn't worried at all. I was fascinated. Oh, you pay this science class? Oh, so you said? I mean, not science. Three years ago, when this video was taken, the entire Holland family decided to get body burden testing for a story in the Oakland Tribune. Their son Rowan was just 18 months old. At the time, he was the youngest child in America to ever be tested for chemical exposure. Michaela was just five years old. And I thought that would be really interesting to see, you know, if mom and dad are high in something, would the kids be high in it too? Their chemical exposure levels were high, but then they got the kids' results, and they were shocked. Rowan and Michaela's levels of chemical exposure were two, three, and four times that of their parents. For phthalates, also called plasticizers, found in plastic bottles, personal care products, and medical devices. For PCBs, they were used in electrical insulators in refrigerators and microwave ovens and banned in the late 1970s. But one number stood out, 
Rowan's level of PBDEs, a class of flame retardants found in everything from foam cushions to rugs to mattresses to casings of electronics. They were nearly seven times the levels of his mom and dad. He has two to three, or at the time of testing, had two to three times the level of um, flame retardant in his body that's been found to cause thyroid dysfunction in lab rats. PBDEs or neurotoxins, they throw off normal brain function in lab animals. So could they be doing the same to children or adults? The answer is we don't know. The federal government had never even received any uh, studies looking at the effects of this chemical on human health because the federal government does not require chemical manufacturers to submit this type of data before bringing the chemical to market. You heard right. The Environmental Protection Agency, which is responsible for chemical regulation, doesn't require manufacturers to test for the effects of new chemicals on human health before getting approved. What's more, the approval process can take as little as 90 days. Compare that to the years it can take for pharmaceutical companies to get new drugs approved. Okay, so watching that video, uh, you know, I want you to pay attention to something. Did those kids look sick? No. No. Do you think they signed up for the study because they were sick? No. No. They, I mean, they just, they just were regular kids. You know, so this is happening to all of them. I mean, this is, all these kids out there, they're getting exposed to all these chemicals and their bodies are not able to deal with this kind of toxicity. So, you know, these, these child or these adult onset diseases that we used to see, now they're happening earlier and earlier and earlier. So... Uh, how do you deal with that? Real short and simple. Um, NeuroCleanse is really the best one that's out there right now uh, as far as dealing with these chemicals and actually pulling them out of the system. Because of it, this is just a bullet list of the big things that, that make the difference. Uh, it contains a complete combination of ingredients to clear toxins from the cell. Uh, so it's actually dealing <coughs> with actual the cellular level. It's not just the colon cleanse. You know, all these things online, you see colon cleanses yeah. everywhere. Great, it deals with your colon. What about the cells in my brain? What about the cells in my arm and my liver and everywhere else? You know, you got to deal with cellular toxicity. It prevents reabsorption of toxins. You know, a lot of these programs that use the right constituents to pull out the, the chemicals, it doesn't actually have anything to bind them up, so it dumps them into your, into your bile. Your bile goes into your intestines, and then it gets reabsorbed. You know, <coughs> you recycle the toxins over and over and over again. It's like, yeah, you feel great when you're taking the stuff, but then it goes right back into your system. It's never really going anywhere. You're just recycling and feeling better because it's dumping it into your intestines just to pull it right back in. Uh, no dangerous side effects uh, other than, you know, we, <coughs> we've seen some patients get constipated and feel kind of cruddy, you know, but that's, that's about it. Uh, curbs cravings while lowering your blood cholesterol levels and <coughs> caloric intake. Now that's interesting. Why would it lower your cholesterol levels? Toxicity, right? Because cholesterol is not a disease. Cholesterol is just a problem of, of incre you know, just, just getting cellular inflammation down. So when you get down cellular inflammation, cholesterol lowers. Okay? Removes resistance to weight loss by correcting leptin levels. It corrects hormone imbalances. It, uh, it covers, uh, you know, it in also increases glutathione, which is the number one antioxidant and detoxifier in the body, which we're going to talk about here in a couple minutes. Uh, so looking at antioxidants, researchers in Denmark recently looked at 25,000 people to find out what drinking alcohol does to mortality and discovered that wine drinkers slash their overall risk of dying from any cause by about 40%. 40% by drinking alcohol, right? So let's all get, go get drunk, right? I was wondering if yeah. I know. No, right? You know, that's, obviously we know there's a problem there. But, but what's the correlation? I mean, what's the correlation? Why would... Why would it would reduce it by 40%. Well, what they did when they looked at all this stuff is they found that it was wine consumption. Okay, so people drinking wine seemed to reduce it. So, curious, you know, let's find out what's going on. Well, they found that resveratrol, which is, it's an antioxidant that's found in grapes, okay? It activates a longevity gene in, in the body. In yeast, they, they did this particular study in yeast that extend their lifespan by 70%. 70%. Okay, and they've done with this with earthworms also and been able to like double their lifespan. You know, so it tends to see that the bigger the organism, the shorter the extension is. You know, but nonetheless, hey, that, that's pretty promising. So the effects mimic those of calorie restriction. Okay, who in here has heard of 
fasting. Okay, very good technique for extending lifespan. Okay, they they took a, they've done multiple studies where they take rats and mice, and, you know, and guinea pigs and all others, you know, and all these different creatures, and they put them through uh, just extended eating, you know, to where they just feed them regularly versus fasting, and they find that consistently the group that fasts they increase their lifespan by thirty to forty percent, you know, so that that's a pretty good chunk of time. I wonder why it says that in the Bible, right? The only proven way to expending, uh, extending maximum lifespan that we know of, you know, so that humans have their own version of the same <coughs> genes. I mean, we all have this. We're all built by the same programming, basically. So the second thing is this DNA debris in the cell is connected to aging. Literally, when your body transcribes genetics, it has some debris that's left over that doesn't really get used, and if your detox pathways aren't working right, it can't filter that out. It can't get that debris out of the nucleus. You know, so that all clutters inside the cells, and then the cells either become cancerous or die, one of the two. Uh, resveratrol reduces the frequency of DNA de debris by 60% through that same longevity gene. Okay, so, you know, this is one of the, one of the you know, big ones that's out there, you know, that you see a lot of, and there is good science on it. I mean, it does, it does have some good science there. But really, the, the master uh, antioxidant in the body is glutathione. Okay, glutathione is a master antioxidant. It, uh, it literally controls everything, um, but the, the thing is with it, you can't take it in. You can't just go to a counter and say, you know, I want some glutathione and take glutathione and have it work. It's not that easy. Glutathione actually has to be manufactured inside of the body for, it to, for its levels to increase. It doesn't work taking it in. So, now if your cells are toxic, you're not making enough. So how many, how many people would you expect to have adequate glutathione levels? No. Not very many, right, because of all the toxins that we're exposed to. So if not enough, then heavy metals and toxins are, there, are then stored in the fat tissue, okay, in adipose tissue because they bind to fat. So now what do we get? A bigger toxicity issue, which, you know, then affects leptin, and then we see weight gain, and what do we see with obesity in America? Continues to go up and up and up as we get more and more toxic. It's all the same cycle. All this stuff is all interconnected. It's not separate issues. Okay, it's all the same problem. Okay, so the brain nerve system, breast and prostate are both <coughs> are mostly fat. Now, when I read this immediately, I'm thinking, well, you know, one of the highest cancer rates in women is what? Breast cancer. One of the highest rates in men is what? Prostate cancer. Well, why is that? Because they're made of fat. So where are the toxins going to bind to? Straight to those organs. So if you have prostate or breast cancer, you know there's a toxicity issue, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, but we already know that because cancer in general is a toxicity issue. Mm -hmm. So, okay, proper amounts of glutathione slow the aging process, detoxify and improve liver function, which further detoxifies the body because that's the primary organ of detoxification. Okay, it strengthens the immune system, reduces the chances of cancer, improves mental functions, increases energy, improves concentration, permits increased exercise, and improves heart and lung function. Anybody would like that? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's just, everybody needs that. I mean, it's just, I mean, I, I want that. You know, everybody wants that. Everybody would like to have those things. So, you know, but this is the primary hormone that's affecting this because of the toxic environment that it's just that hard to achieve. Okay? Even if you're healthy. Yes, even if you're healthy. So, NeuroCleanse naturally increases GSH because it provides the body with all the raw materials and cofactors needed. So you're not putting directly in glutathione, but they're using all the research that is actually proven to naturally increase it in the body just by giving it the building blocks. Okay, but not only that, they also, it's actually formulated to maintain your healthy glutathione by, by eliminating destruction of the glutathione that's there via toxicity because you're removing the toxins at the same time. Does that make sense? So you've got a two-part process. Number one, over here, it's increasing glutathione, which increases your body, body's natural ability to deal with toxins. But on this side, it's also decreasing the toxins that are in the system by releasing them and binding them up. So it's very rapidly reversing the situation. Okay? Uh, NeuroCleanse system provides so, true cellular detoxification, like I said, because it's actually catching the toxins in the gut. It's not just reversing it and then just sloshing it all back around. <coughs> so, uh, we do have information on it, you know, but that's, uh, that's definitely the, the easiest way to deal with toxicity. 
Now, the hormone of youth, uh, that's HH. Anybody ever heard of that? Human growth hormone, okay? Mm -hmm. It's produced by the pituitary gland, which is a, just a small pea-sized gland in your brain, okay? It fuels childhood growth and helps maintain tissues and, or and organs throughout your life. Uh, they did this study, okay, in the, in the uh, clinical endocrinology and metabolism. Ten years of taking growth hormone uh, replacement in Gluta in, in a growth hormone deficient adults. So these are people that did not have enough uh, growth hormone. So just by giving them supplementation, they were able to <laughs> normalize muscle strength. And what they're finding now in even newer research is that they're taking men in their 80s, you know, and they're giving them uh, excessive, you know, uh, intensive exercise such as surge training, you know, and stuff like that. And they're and they're naturally increasing their uh, human growth hormone levels. And they're finding that they're measuring their muscles and finding that their strength is equivalent to 20 and 30 year olds mm -hmm. at 80 years old. How is that possible, right? We're mm -hmm. supposed to be getting old at that point. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a lie. You know, it's our bodies are designed to last, you know, 100, 120 years mm -hmm. in really pretty good health, you know, and, and being able to function all the way until the end. You know, so we're not meant to just, you know, d deteriorate and, you know, melt away with, with cancer and, and heart disease. So, but we're seeing that happen, you know, to men and women in their 40s now. Uh, while HGH strengthens bones, helps people grow and regulates metabolism, all those things is what hormones do. Okay, it also coordinates all immune, nervous, and hormonal activities in the mind and body on a regular basis. That's what growth factors do. So it's not really a hormone, it's actually more of a growth factor. Okay, now also growth hormone is secreted by many cells and it travels in both the blood and the lymph like growth factors. So it's got the properties of hormones, but it's also got the properties of growth factors. Okay, so the good thing there is now we know we can increase it because growth factors are easy to, easier to deal with without actually injecting it in. So what are some of the symptoms? Um, presence of HGH in a healthy adult declines at a rate of 14% per decade after 30. Okay, typically after 30 years old, you see it start to plummet. By the age of 80, it's typically not even there. People are so depleted that it's gone completely. And that's why their cells can't regenerate. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You know, so your cells get weaker and weaker and weaker in their ability to regenerate themselves. I mean, you should be having a new body every two years. You know, and everybody always asks, well, why do I get the same body over and over again? <laughs> and it seems to get worse every two years. It's because your body's not replacing itself effectively and efficiently. So this is one factor behind it. Symptoms include fatigue, increased weight and abdominal obesity, decreased lean body mass, muscle mass and strength, and decreased exercise capacity and physical performance, cold extremities, reduced vitality, impaired sense of well-being, poor sleep, and emotional instability and anxiety. Does that sound like a few Americans? Yeah. Maybe some of this room, yes. right? Okay. Now, HH injections, right? That's what we always hear about. The you know, movie stars and professional athletes are all getting the injections. Well, the bummer is it costs about twenty thousand dollars a year to do the injections. And of course, when you introduce anything unnatural into the body that's not supposed to be there from inside out, what happens? You get side effects. You always get side effects. So, you know, it's got well-documented side effects, including <coughs> diabetes, heart disease. You know, nobody wants those, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, there, there is a better way of doing it. The, uh, this, this stuff is actually, uh, there, there's a movie, um, The Constant Gardener. Has anybody seen that? Okay. Well, that movie was actually based on the lady that developed this. I've spoken to her multiple times myself, uh, Dr. Barbara Burrick. She's a, I mean, she's brilliant. And, uh... Basically, she, she took this product, she developed this stuff, and she brought it over to Africa and started giving it to the children that had AIDS in a community where the drug companies were supplying them with AIDS drugs, okay? And so she goes in there with this HGH spray and starts giving it to all these kids that were bleeding out of the nose and the ears and the eyes and everything, I mean, ready to die. And within a matter of months, all the kids in the community were healthy. And so the drug company came back in and asked, you know, and was coming in to take orders. And they said, we don't want your drugs. And so guess what they did? They came back to the United States. They raided her office. They, take, they took all of her research. They, they uh, had her arrested for practicing medicine without a license. And I think she's been sued like five or six times so far. And then, you know, and 
she just, I mean, when I talked to her last, she was actually going into court the next day, you know, fighting them again on something else. So they're trying to dismantle her. Why? Yeah, because it works. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you can literally, yeah, yeah. When, when something works out well to increase your, your body's natural ability to repair itself, that's dangerous. That's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Same reason why they just took off uh, um, DMSA. DMSA is our chelating agent for heavy metals. The FDA just made it a drug. So we can't get it anymore. Mm. It's not a drug. But the good thing is, shh, we're actually getting a new, better one. So, uh, <laughs> so don't this, tell them. Is this what some, um, I don't know what kind of, it's not really, I don't know if it's doctors or what, but um, they give patients through the veins? Yes. So, yes. Yes, they're giving them injections. Yeah. My you know? nephew's taking yeah. them. I actually have patients that well, have gone them. out, and you know, and I'll find out later that oh. they've been doing these. There's like, a place in Fairhope that does. Yeah, I mean, they're costly. They're they're spending a fortune getting injections. I'm like, what it costs Medi you? Medicare don't forty five bucks. <laughs> I mean, literally, the the bottle of this, by the way, is forty nine dollars. And you know, if anybody wants it tonight, we wanted to you know give you guys a cut back mm -hmm. on it. So. So she's going to write you down for a 10% discount if anybody wants to order it. But it, it works. I've, I've been taking it myself. I've been taking all of them for, you know, just switching them in combination for the last, like, three months. And, I mean, within a matter of, you know, six weeks, I had put on five, ten pounds of muscle alone. You know, so it's, uh, it, it does make a difference. So, okay, next thing, exercise. Everybody knows that, okay, but I wanted to drill this part in, okay, the average 65-year-old can expect an additional 12.7 years of healthy life, okay? By, that would put you up to the 77-year mark, okay? Meaning he will live disability-free until age 77.7, .7, okay? This is according to the Center of Disease Control. Now, highly active 65-year-olds, however, you know, like the ones who run the Azalea Trail Run with us on March 28th, hint, hint, okay, uh, have an additional 5.7 years of healthy life expectancy on top of that. So that means they will remain disability-free until age 83.4, okay? So do you think any of those 83.4-year-olds, when they finally, you know, develop some kind of disability, are saying, man, bummer. I wish I had not exercised and wasted all this time because now I'm broken. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. They're glad that they have that extra six years. I mean, six years is a long time. I don't even remember. Well, I wasn't practicing chiropractic six years ago. And that's a long time. I didn't have kids six years ago. So we have found a direct relationship between the level of physical activity and the length of life. Okay? This is the first good evidence that people who are active and fit have a longer lifespan than those who are not. Is that not just common sense? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's common sense, yeah, but how many it. Americans exercise at all? Mm. It's like 10%, 8 to 10%, <coughs> something like that. Mm. Yeah. So uh, exercise produces chemicals and physiological changes that improves your mental health. It changes the levels of hormones and blood. It may elevate your beta endorphins, mood affecting brain chemicals. Exercise also gives a feeling of accomplishment and thereby reduces the sense of helplessness, which we call depression. Mm -hmm. Okay, the largest study measuring fitness ever carried out suggests that even modest amounts of exercise can substantially reduce your chance of dying of heart disease, cancer, or other causes, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so we all know this. So who in here is going to set up an exercise program tomorrow? I started last month. You started last month. Good for you. Good for Five you. Five days a week. Mm. Good for you. Now, how many people have been told or have the belief system well, yeah, I'm out. I can't, you know, because I have, I have, uh, I have a bum wrist, right? I, I say that because guess what? She has two bum wrists, and she still shows up for our surge training group every Saturday morning. You know, so it's we we have these ideas that we get set up. We call them. That it starts with the knee. Can anybody guess? Excuses. Excuses, right? You know, why we can't exercise. But there are no excuses. You can, you know, as long as you can use one joint in your body. I mean, let's say you're sitting in a chair, in a wheelchair. You got a body cast on, but you got one elbow. Well, guess what? I'd be the one sitting there going, you know, what I'm <laughs> I'd be exercising that one joint, burning some fuel. You know, we, it, yeah, we have disabilities, but you know, get over it, right? Get over it. We got to do something to keep ourselves moving because it's our life on the line. It's not our life. You got to get beyond yourself. And start thinking about the other people around you, you know, mm -hmm. your friends, your family, your your spouse. 
So, okay, going back to the main thing, though, you know, what really deals above and beyond all this stuff, I mean, plain and simple, it's the nervous system. You can't look at anything else and not look at the nervous system in terms mm -hmm. of what's going to keep you alive. This is just a few of the studies. Older persons with hyperkyphotic posture, that means like this, uh -oh. okay, increased kyphosis in the thoracics, or, you know, they're, they're just hunched over. They're more mm -hmm. likely to have physical functional difficulties. Moderate hyperkyphotic hyper posture may significantly or it may signify an easily identifiable <laughs> independent risk factor for injurious falls. So what does that come down to? We're more uh, non-coordinated, right? Mm -hmm. Because how is coordination affected? Nerve system, mm -hmm. right? Your, your brain has to talk to your legs. Well, mm -hmm. if you're bent over and you're putting compression and stretch on your cord and it's degenerating, can you see how that might affect the brain to brain to leg connection? Mm -hmm. Right. You know, hyperkyphotic posture was, was specifically associated with an increased rate of death due to atherosclerosis, which is arthritis. Mm -hmm. Is that a disease? No. No. It's, it's uh, nothing more than degeneration. Spinal kyphosis caused demyelination and neuronal loss in the spinal cord. Who in here has heard that one before? <laughs> I <coughs> never. Come on. Come on. I, I, should, have, know what I should have one, two that have never heard that before. Because every single one of the rest of you guys have been in my doctor's report, and we talk about that. What is right? it? Spinal kyphosis, that's a loss of the cervical curve. See, now oh. I'm talking your language. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. A loss of your cervical curve causes demyelination and neuronal loss in the spinal cord. Your oh. spinal cord degenerates. Oh, yeah. Okay? They've come out with a couple <laughs> other studies that, you know, that I, I couldn't find to put into this. Uh, in time, my, my four-year-old was tugging at my leg, saying, get off the computer. You know, so, but a couple other studies just in the last six months have come out saying that uh, increased kyphosis caused increased incidence of stroke, and the other one says an increased risk of heart disease or heart attack. Is that what atherosclerosis is? Uh, uh, atherosclerosis, you know what, I'm retarded, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I totally breeze past this. Yeah, that's, see, you know where my brain is. I'm thinking, well, if you're hunched over, you've got degeneration. That's true, yeah, atherosclerosis, that, uh, she just educated the doctor, thank you. Um, that's actually heart disease in the first place. You know, but it does increase degeneration too, so I'm glad you caught that. Okay, so uh, this is what happens without chiropractic. Okay, just watch this here. I know most of you guys have already seen this video. It's always shocking to see, even if you've seen it before. Mm -hmm. But how many people does this happen to? I mean, everybody. It's I, I mean, I just you. I say everybody in terms of most people, mm -hmm. you know. But why does that happen? If you had a normal cervical curve, would that happen? No, it wouldn't. That doesn't happen in normal cervical curves. Your spine is your spine designed to last. Yes. Yeah. If you don't believe that or you question that at all, look in your coffin 500 years from now. Yeah. There's only one thing left, the bones. Yeah, They're designed to last. They're wow. not supposed to deteriorate. Do these deteriorate because the bones are actually smashing? Mm -hmm. No. The bones are not smashing. Your body is building out bone on purpose. Mm -hmm. On purpose to deal with that extra weight. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? That's why I would say arthritis is not a disease. You can't stand it when they say degenerative arthritis. It's not a disease. Okay? It's the body's natural process of, in, of dealing with that increased pressure. But it happens every time when you lose that curve. So how, well, how much attention should you be paying to making sure that that curve stays in place? Okay? So who in here, and I, I should get an overwhelming response here, who in here knows how to do that? We all do. Okay. Okay. How do we do that? Now start start throwing out some things. That thing on your neck. Okay, the traction. What else? Come to your adjustments. Adjustments, good. What else? Exercise. Exercise, right. What else? Good posture. Good posture. How about hydration levels? You know, the fulcrums, the wobble, the all glasses. these all these different things. I mean there's the head weights, right? Glasses, you know, all these different things. They're designed 
and they're proven to actually, and in fact, we prove it by looking at the stress x-rays, right? You know, over mm -hmm. here, can I tell them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, hers went from, hers increased like 30 degrees or 40 degrees or how much was it? Negative 7 to 30. Negative 7 to 34 wow. in one stress x-ray. Wow. You know, just just by, by putting those weights on. Have you been doing all on. the exercises? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good encouragement. You know, yeah. so some of, now some of you guys, you came in before we started doing the stress x-rays. You know, we, we just started doing those like nine months ago. But, I mean, literally now we can prove to you right away it works. You know, so now it's just like, okay, well, you know, and I knew it all along. But now it's nice to be able to go back and say, well, you know, it's, it, we, I mean, you already see it works. So what do we know ain't happening? Mm -hmm. the, the, yeah, the activity. You know, the stuff to actually make that happen and stay like that isn't happening. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's just going through the steps. Okay, now this is, this is with chiropractic, and this has audio. So you can't really see this very well, but listen. What we want you to concentrate on here is the size of the foramen magnum, the disc herniations, and the overall image that you're getting of the cerebral cortex. I want you also to look at the ventricular fibrillation here. It's a term classified by one of the neuroradiologists of the ventricles. <coughs> by the way, this is the uh, this is the only uh, view of ventricular motion. Uh, as far as we know, to date. You're about to see the post, and then we'll discuss back and forth a few times. It'll flesh back and forth so you see it. Now we're going to go to the post. <clears throat> notice here, first notice the ventricles. Notice the change in size of the foramen magnum. Notice the disc herniations here. More importantly, notice the change down here. And the overall image, notice the change in pulsation of cerebral spinal fluid. Please. One, two, three, four, five, six. Notice the rhythm involved. Notice the flow of the cerebral spinal fluid descending down. So, you know, this, this stuff is out there. I mean, this, this, all this stuff, all this stuff that we talk about, it's all out there. I mean, all the research is out there proving the same thing again and again and again. This was one chiropractic adjustment that they did in between taking the pre and the post, and they were able to show video fluoroscopy chains immediately of the difference in the flow through the spinal cord, immediately seeing the CSF flow and bathe and nourish the spinal cord which is bringing it back to life. You know, so, I mean, these are just basic, fundamental, easy things, but, I mean, that's, there's nothing that gets easier in, in literally extending your life than making sure that life can get to your body, right? Mm -hmm. There's nothing easier. That is the fundamental. It's, you know, it's, even coming in here, I'm, I'm sure you guys probably thought, wow, this is going to be a chiropractic workshop. I mean, if you didn't think that, you see how you should have thought that? Yeah. I mean, because there's nothing that simple. I mean, it's just... Yeah, we can spend money on antioxidants, but if you cut the nerve to your stomach, what 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 are the antioxidants going to do? Nothing. Nothing. If you take uh, human growth hormone, but you're paralyzed from the spinal cord, you know, from the neck down, like Christopher mm -hmm. Reeve, was that HGH going to help? No. No, not at all. That's got to come first. That's the foundation that makes all that other stuff work, because it's that power in your brain flowing down your spinal cord, out your nerves, to all your cells, tissues, and organs that tell those cells, tissues, and organs what to do with what you're doing. Does that make sense? Yeah. So everything else, the nutrition, the exercise, all that stuff, it's completely secondary to the big idea, the big principle, right? Okay, so uh, any form of subluxation affecting the same nerve, you know, if, if you cut the nerve, we obviously know what happens, the organ mm -hmm. dies. If you subluxate, whether it's physical, chemical, emotional, all those things affect the nerve system. Any one of those subluxations, it does exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. Does everybody see that? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, what percentage of the population do you guess that's happening to? Mm, about 9%. Yeah. Oh, I mean, let's just look at the statistics. Uh, what percentage of people are currently under chiropractic care? 
These these numbers are gonna scare you. Yeah, I, I hope they scare you. Okay, it's it's actually six percent. Guess where it's been for the last you know thirty forty years. Six percent. So you know it's basically six percent of the population. You know where the turning point is? Where they call it basically the critical mass, the tipping point. For most products, it's about ten percent. Once you get ten percent market saturation, all of a sudden there's an explosion. You know, Coca-Cola when they got ten percent of the people using, you know, drinking soda, all of a sudden it exploded on the scene. That's just a market force. They call it market forces. But we've been stuck at six percent. What do you think stuck us there? The medical. I, I honestly don't think so. You know what stuck us there? People not. Really, and, being educated, really. Right. Oh, and who controls that? Yeah. No. Well, yeah, you, but Doctors. Chiropractors. Yeah. The problem is, is that we become pain managers. I mean, it's just, I mean, be honest. How many in here are kind of here because you know this is good for pain? Because it makes you feel better. I mean, be honest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, I, I know that. I go home and beat my head on the door every day. You know, it's, it's, I mean, that's, as you can see, that's what all the educated, that's what all the stuff is about, is constantly to try and bust down that wall. But I'm trying to bust down a wall that's been up for 50, 60 years. Because insurance, basically insurance came along, and chiropractors said, ooh, that's easy money. So they started running the insurance, and in order to do that, we became pain managers. You know, so as it stands, so think about this, 6% of the population is under chiropractic care, but how many, uh, how, what percentage of chiropractors do corrective-based, wellness-based, subluxation-based, power that made the body, heals the body-based chiropractic? Maybe what percentage? Six. It's three to four percent. Three to four percent. So what percentage of the population is under true principle-based holistic chiropractic care? That's, no, that's like, what, a fraction of a percent. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're taking four percent of six percent. No. Mm -hmm. That's like, I mean, it's a fraction. So do you think we need a little bit of help getting the word yeah. out? Yeah. So um, our, next, our, our, our next opportunity to do that, our next big thing that, that we just started doing these, but uh, community dinner. Next Monday night we have a community dinner where basically just so we can get the, the principal out to as many people as possible, we're just opening up a community dinner where you guys can invite your friends. You just tell them, you know, Dr. Mike is having a, a dinner uh, on Monday night, Ruby Tuesday, 7 o'clock. We need to get you an RSVP. We get them RSVP just so that we know that they're coming. And we're basically just trying to pack out a room with people that have never heard the principal. And we give it to them, and I walk out. And if anybody wants to do anything with it, at least they've heard the principal. And it's a little bit like preaching, you know. <laughs> and so... <laughs> so, you know, and guess what? Next month we'll do it again. And the next month we'll do it again. And when we're filling up one workshop, we'll add a second one. You know, I don't care. It's just we've got to get the message out. We've got to get the information out. Because otherwise, all you know, all this stuff that we keep talking about, we're going to see our, our kids dying, you know, in their 40s and 50s repetitively. I mean, the, the, the life expectancy, I hope you can see through going through this stuff, we're headed to the 60s. We're going from the 70s. And we're going to start, we, we are starting that descent going down into the 60s and maybe even lower. That's not acceptable. So, is everybody in here willing to help? Yeah. Okay, does everybody in here know one person that they can, that they can tell about the dinner next week? Raise your hand. What, what yes? is it? Okay, next Monday night at, six oh. at 7 o'clock. I won't be there at 6. I'll still be here adjusting you guys. So, uh, 7 o'clock, what, what she's going to do, she's going to give you guys, or if you can see her, but, I mean, we'll, we'll lock the door if we have to. Uh, we'll get, we'll just everybody get one name to her at the front. And then if you can, go home and call them tonight and let them know, you know, that we're going to be calling and inviting them. If they want to schedule, you know, if they want to go, fine. If they don't want to go, fine. You know, but, okay. but you know, we, we just, we need help. You know, we can't, uh, we can't get to everybody ourselves. So, uh, where? It's at Ruby Tuesdays, but uh, uh, right by Providence Hospital. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, you can go ahead and pass around sheets. While she's doing that, does anybody have any questions about about the content, or any any questions I mean, related you have to the, it? Uh, the toxic clean, the, the neuro cleanse. We've only got one box, but we are taking pre-orders though. So she's about to put in an order. You can either do it. I mean, you can buy it in office, but honestly, if you're having to wait for the shipping anyways, you're better off just putting in an order online. 
because here we have to sell it for $77.95, but if you order it online, it's $64.95. And um, through the maximum living uh, She'll actually give you a packet, okay. and it's got our website on there. You oh, can just okay. get it straight from there. I do want that. Person. Okay. The um, body burden test that she did for her and her children, um, is that something that um, y'all do here? or No. Uh, well... Yes, we do, um, but we do it in a different means. We actually have, um, it's called a comprehensive metabolic profile. Uh, we just got the information and everything on it to be able to start doing it. Um, it is a, it's a pretty costly test. I mean, it's, it's about five, five to seven hundred dollars for this test, but it looks at everything. I mean, it looks at organic uh, uric acids, you know, all these, all these uh, acids in your urine. It looks at your blood. It looks at all that, you know, all these different factors, and it can literally tell you exactly what nutrients you're deficient in in your body, so that you can specifically target what you need to take. You know, it's no more guesswork. I mean, the the research that's out there now is just phenomenal of what we have available to us. There's nothing that you can do literally in in drugs that we can't do naturally. Any other questions? The other thing, guests, uh, you know, two guests, hey, um, we're going to get you guys set up for an initial examination, you know, so we can take your x-rays. That's something we do for our guests. You know, it, don't, it won't cost you anything. You know, we can, we can at least get an x-ray, look and see what your arc is looking like. Have you guys ever seen chiropractors before? No? Yes? Are you under chiropractic care? No? Okay. Well, that answers it. So, all right. Uh, any other questions? Nope. Okay. Good night.